This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It is noon on Thursday, folks. Ted Ralston here overlooking downtown Honolulu in our Think Tech studio with our show, Where the Drone Leads. And you might ask, uh, where the drone leads, uh, where's the lead today? Well, the drone can lead all the way to Mars, uh, if you can believe that, uh, stopping at the moon on the way. And uh, on our show today, we have uh, two incredible people who were involved in that very activity. We have standing by on the Big Island, both by Skype. We have Hank Rogers, and we have John. There you are. Okay, we got Hank and John, and uh, both involved in the international moon base project is coming around. And it's, one might ask, how does an international moon base project relate to drones? It relates to drones when that discussion took place about a year ago in the state capitol where we had uh, the uh, annual aerospace day at the space, at, at the capitol. And uh, one of our panels in the unmanned air systems or drone domain had a very excited response to a space challenge that Hank Rogers threw his way. And there's been incredible interest in how these two ends of the STEM spectrum come together. Drones on the one end, dealing maybe at the marina level, space travel at the other end, dealing in the Mars level. And so you just had a conference last week, Hank, where you pulled all these things together, including students and educational programs, talking about the International Moon Base Project and how it might be going forward. Tell us a little bit about how that went. Well, it, went, uh, it was amazing. You know, my original expectation was I was going to be able to get the leaders of all the space agencies, which is, of, of course, like way out of my league because I don't know any of these people. But what I did get was uh, very close to the tops of a lot of different companies and space agencies get together and tell us what their thinking is. So, so basically the way it went was we had a half a day of speeches and then a half day of working groups. And there were students in every working group. So the voice of the students was heard and actually it was probably the loudest voice in the room at the end of the at the end of the conference so yes we are going to build a moon base yes we're going to we're going to we figured out a spot on the moon where we're going to do it uh, we figured out pretty much a spot in hawaii where we're going to do it because hawaii is almost the same as the moon in terms of the material and so this is going to be a Hawaii-centric first step in the restaging of access to the moon. And so you'll experience uh, the, the isolation and the necessary design standards and things that will allow systems to operate in that austere environment. And the astronomy orientation has to provide a lot of guidance and, uh, uh, and frame of thought in terms of what those challenges and threats and risks are. So that's where John comes into the picture. Yeah, well, as Hank was saying, you know, Hawaii is the right place, and we believe this is the right time. Uh, Hawaii's geologic terrain is probably the best place in the entire world to test anything going to the moon and for Mars. Uh, it's a very recent geologic uh, activity, so it hasn't weathered, and so it simulates the, the lunar dust extremely well. And uh, we've had very successful what we call analog tests of uh, robotic equipment here uh, over the past 10 years from, from NASA, from the Canadian Space Agency, European Space Agency, and it's been an unparalleled success. So this is the place in the world to, to do something like this, uh, not only because of, of our, um, you know, the, the high fidelity science aspect of the analogs, but, um, you know, if you compare it to going to Antarctica or the Arctic, there are very good analog sites there, but you don't want to go there in the winter, and it, it costs you a few million dollars to mount an expedition. So globally, we're well-placed where anyone from around the world can get to Hawaii easily, and every day of the year, we can be doing real productive work. And that's, that's really incredible, and that would apply primarily on the Big Island, where you have a lot of space, and you have a mo the more recent geology uh, of the island chain. And um, the thing that's interesting to me is, as we said at the very beginning, the whole world of STEM 
uh, doesn't really care about scale. STEM, STEM can operate at the scale of a lunar mission, a Martian mission, or even a small mission to the marina here with a small drone. The same principles of systems engineering and understanding the threats and decomposing the problem down to solvable stages and then composing up a solution based on approaching those various issues that are barriers uh, applies in both cases. But And it's the, it's the young people, the kids, who are going to be taking care of all that. So getting their interest up and seeing the commonality between things that apply at the infrastructure level all the way to the uh, interplanetary level is, is, to me, is a really interesting thing if we can cause that to happen and cause them to take on the even more challenging issue of how do you generate safety and reliability and repeatability in something as large in scale as that. You know, that's the, just private, just personally from a uh, aerospace experience background, the world of STEM really needs that additional wrapper around it of the uh, risk management, reliability, and safety mm -hmm. aspects and the, the thinking and the, the, the mathematical methods that will learn, that will lead to the understanding of a system's behavior far away and a long time from now and have it be reliable, robust, and safe. So if we can co collectively through the drone game and the Martian game, figure out how that STEM framework can have that wrapper of safety, security, reliability, and trustworthiness wrapped around it. What a value that would be to infrastructure writ large. Are you asking me something here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah, so, you a champion. You know, and, uh, and so I think that the E, the A, uh, you know, STEM should be STEAM. I think the art, the, the design, uh, is going to play a very important factor when we actually go. When we go to the moon, whatever we build on the moon is going to be the most amazing piece of, of construction that we've ever done uh, in the entire history of man. And so what happens is if, we, if somebody asks us to build them the biggest, newest building in Dubai, you know, for example, that thing is going to look amazing. And, and when people go there, they're going to look at it and say, wow, that was so awesome. And that we need that wow factor. So, yes, the safety and all those things, they're, they're important. But I, I think also the design, the architecture, the creature comforts, the attraction of the place, those are all, I, I would say, equally as important. Because people are going to have to want to go there. You know, it's not just people that are like, we expect everybody to have a chance to go there at some point in time. You know, I yeah. think that there's a, this I can, before we go to John again, I can um, hijack your thought for a moment. I think that actually what you just said is, is the key to that whole issue of safety and reliability and system performance. That's the A aspect of STEM, the A, the, the arts the artistic solutions, the art of the possible. Uh, and if I can say as an engineer, uh, engineers have proudly stolen everything they can from the art world. All the terms we use like energy, force, uh, momentum, power, <clears throat> those all began life in, in, uh, in philosophy or in art expression. And they had some broad, maybe ambiguous meaning. Engineers stole those words and put specific measurements to them, specific calculations to them, and then use them in design, as design tools, but really swipe them from the artist in the first place. So the big picture always starts at the A level, at the art level, and then gets transferred through engineering into practices. So somewhere in there is the, 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 the frame of reference of something that works reliably, works all the time and does it right, reliability, safety, that sort of thing, has an A component to it. It would be interesting to take an analogy to automobiles, for example, or self-driving cars, or uh, aviation, and, and other, and medicine, for example, anything that works reliably, reliably, and see how that analog applies to this world here of STEM, and, uh, and we could actually use the Martian experience and the moon base experience to drive attention on that. That's what I feel. I think it'd be fascinating. And mathematics, which is an art, is, is the means by which that will all be expressed. And that leads back over to astronomy, which is all math. 
Well, there's a lot of math in it. <laughs> there's a famous cartoon that, that where the students are asking the professor, what's the difference between, between astrology and astrophysics? And the professor says, lots and lots of math. <laughs> yeah. um, so we, we do use mathematics as, as a language and, and a tool. And, you know, you're, you're very right with the systems engineering. It's sort of like the, the, the physics of engineering. You put all the components together, and it's an orchestra. They all have to play together. And human factors is, is a large part of where art comes in. I mean, we had uh, famous artist Roger Dean at, at the conference, and it was a blend of the science and the arts. And it was really brought out through architecture that if we can build a base for robots very easily, very cheap. But if we're going to have humans there, the humans have to feel comfortable living there. There are aspects to architecture that, with just besides the color, but the shape of the rooms and, and how the size of the rooms and, and how people feel comfortable. And even though they can work in these environments, uh, subconsciously, these these outer design elements can come to play in their mind and produce a lot of stress, and that's exactly the worst thing we want to do. Uh, so there's, there's huge components of, of blending the humanity in with the science, and we're, if we're going to have a real viable village. And you know what the engineers have done with that very conversation you just led? They've taken that, that aspect of the interaction with the machine, and they've called it man-machine interface, they've called it human factors, they've called it something like that, and there is a merge an emerging science that understands that. And in fact, that has to, that that has to apply to drones also. We have to say drones in this program because it's about drones. But that same <laughs> issue applies there because today we have one guy with a hand controller and one drone flying in the sky somewhere. That isn't a very sustainable picture. We have to have the system fly by itself. It has to know when to land and take off by itself, uh, mm -hmm. just like we do on Mars. And so this whole issue of interacting, the human interacting with the machine and how that's to be controlled, is it by fingertips, is it by voice, exactly what is it, is a fascinating study in itself. And as you say, the lower the stress, the higher the value of the interaction. And the mm -hmm. less we can become involved with these things and the more they can decide for themselves what the mission needs to be and execute, the better we are. So again, a common, very common tie between the world of small drones that we deal in and the world of uh, moon and Martian operations that you deal in. So uh, there's a, a branch of math there somewhere, John. We gotta go figure it out. Well, that does point out the value of before we build a moon base on the moon, uh, building a prototype here, this is where we can test all these factors and, and blend everything together and, and really you know find out what, maybe not what the best combination is, but some of the more optimal ones. And it will probably be an organic solution that they'll come up, the people that are working in there and living in there are going to come up with solutions that the outside people hadn't thought of. And uh, we hope to incorporate those into the uh, eventual one on the moon. Okay, so what's going to happen there is in that world of complex system interaction, the, the feeling of arts and the appreciation of something from that perspective will occur, and then the engineers will swipe that, will label it something, and come up with a frame of reference for how to, how to calculate it. Hank. Yeah, I, you know, I don't like the reference to engineering engineers swiping or stealing ideas because <laughs> artists create those ideas uh, as food for thought for the engineers. Artists can envision things, but they need the engineers to build them. So I, I, I think that that ecosystem of design and engineering is what gets us everything that we know. Mm -hmm. uh, without engineers, none of that would become reality. Um, but let me talk a little bit about the the connection between drone swarm ability and what I envision for the future. And I'm thinking way in the future. Because right now, uh, if you ask NASA, how are you going to build something on the moon? They would tell you, well, we're going to take the same kind of, of units that we use to make for the uh, International Space Stations, like big cans uh, that fit on top of rockets. And we're going to make it out of those and connect them. And then you have a moon base. And then you have Robert Bigelow who says, you know what, I can, in that same space, I can put an inflatable so we can start with something that's the shape of a cannon and blow it up into something much bigger. And the problem with all of that, uh, first of all, is that you have to bury everything under two meters of regolith on the moon. Regolith is the is basically what the powder or the the grains of that's on the the moon dust, and that's to protect against um, uh, cosmic rays and par charged particles coming from the sun. The moon has no mag magnetic field, and it has no atmosphere, which is all things that protect us from that stuff. So, if we're building something on Earth and we're using 
uh, robots, or we could say telerobotics. We can control them because they're right next to us. Uh, but if they're on the moon, they're three seconds away. And so that creates a little bit more of a complication. But if it's on Mars, they're 20 minutes away. And it's a 20-minute round trip to communicate with them. So, you know, as we see with the with the rover, where people have gave instructions every once in a while, and then they have to think about what are you going to do for the next hour, you know, that's a really slow way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So by the time we get to building stuff on Mars, and I would say we should practice it on the moon, is these things are going to have to operate autonomously. So autonomous construction robots. I like to think that they're sort of like our version of termites, so that they can dig, they can build, they can do everything that termites do. And I'm talking about African termites, not the one that, that are like weaving and having my house. I'm talking about Africa where they build mounds and they have like civilizations underground where they grow food and all that stuff. We're going to have to learn from them what to do on the moon. And if we can create robots that communicate with each other and do all that stuff, hey man, that's a home run. And that's something that we can do here in Hawaii. We can study all that stuff. And you know, I think you just laid the, the base for bringing quantum calculation, quantum computers into this game. Because what you just outlined is such a complex adaptive system that I don't think the, what I call the linear programming we use here in most of our operations, which are basically, used to be Fortran and it got turned into various other engineering uh, codes, but that is all rule-based and, and role-based to a large extent. We've got to make this conditional-based or self-determined in some way similar to the way the termites operate, as you say, or people operate. So there's a whole branch, and I would suggest there's a term called uh, linguistic uh, geometry that is a budding branch of math that tries to look at strategic superiority for how you make decisions. It uses the structure of language, once again the arts. It uses, language has all incredible power. It's got adjective verbs, nouns, it's got various things that have, that convey meaning. And these guys have begun using that as a frame of reference for the math. And so that the math can, can sort of do reasoning based on both expedient, least cost, least risk, whatever it might be, in very small computer frames, laptops. So there's a whole dimension here that is to me fascinating. And we need to not let uh, John off the hook as our representative of the math organizations here and uh, have, him <laughs> have him own that. But we'll get back to that. We're taking a one minute break and be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? And they told me they were making music. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history, Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Still Thursday noon, folks. Ted Rawson here at downtown Honolulu and our compatriots over on the Big Island, Hank Rogers, John Hamilton from uh, both the International Moon Base uh, Organization and from University of Hawaii Department of uh, uh, Physics and astronomy. <laughs> and math. We'll put math in there, too. Okay. We're having a violent conversation about how exciting the future is going to be with the kinds of things that are on the horizon that uh, you're stimulating, Hank, and the partnership you brought together last week. Uh, we, I think it would be appropriate to uh, give a shout-out to all those folks who attended that and talk a little bit about what came out of that from a motivation perspective and where it might go. But we don't want to let go of this idea of incredible math uh, coming to the picture in ways we might not even know yet that are going to be useful to handle these really complex systems in a, in a, in a, in a really effective way. So again, 
a shout out to those folks who came and a little bit of what you see coming as the next step out of the moon base conference last week are you asking i guess so um so what i what i see we we had nine working groups and uh again students were involved in all nine groups and so each of the working groups now has sort of a life of its own and we're uh, looking to go to the, whatever next step for each one of those there that that's coming on for example we have a group that is uh, on commercialization. And that commercialization group is all about trying to figure out how to make money by doing all of this, going to the moon or even during the prototyping phase. And it's amazing the ideas that the high school students came up that we're actually trying to, going to try to uh, put into action uh, as, as ways to fund this whole thing because traditionally it's been uh, been funded by the taxpayer through NASA and so the whole Apollo program was uh, was a huge uh, you can call it a burden but the way it was done is is and the way things get done in NASA or in the government in general is you know you have an idea then you go out and, and get an RFP and then a bunch of companies compete and then you come up with a program that costs X amount of money but that's not how uh, private industry works. If you want, you know, if you're thinking that you're going to build a product, you're just going for it, and you're not spending huge amounts of money. So I think that uh, the moon base is going to be a public-private partnership. That's another working group. How do we how to, how do we manage public-private partnerships? Uh, rather than have it be a, the government who does it, like the ISS, how do you do it with a public-private private partnership which brings the cost way down. ISS costs billions of dollars and it's still like everybody's afraid of it. And that's just because there were only space agencies involved. If we had private companies involved that brought systems to bear on, on that project uh, that were doing it for other reasons besides spending taxpayers money or whatever you want to call it, um, I think we would have had a much lower price point and then it would be much easier to swallow for the public. And, and because it's within range of companies actually doing it themselves, you get people funding their own thing. And so this is going to be a, a transition in the way space is looked at, similar to what's taking place in the, in the space launch game today. We've got SpaceX, we've got Blue Origin, we've got a few other companies out there that are completely changing the landscape in terms of how uh, rocket launch uh, occurs. And the price has come down to half what it is from the traditional suppliers. So the same thing is going to occur here. You're going to have a commercial motivation, and in particular, as you've done, associate with the kids. I was really intrigued by your comment that every one of those nine working groups had students involved in it, high school students. Is that right? High school that students is involved in all nine, and they're going to have a principal role. They're going to inherit this in 10 or 15 years. And so uh, the role is bigger than just as an advisor. They are the participants and they are the beneficiaries of all this work. They, they are the future. And as, as Hank had brought out earlier, that during the Apollo landing, the average age of most of the engineers at NASA were in their mid-20s, which meant that they were in school when Kennedy gave his famous speech. So the, these are the future people that are going to be doing everything up there. You know, we good. go to the moon not because it's easy, but because it's hard. That was the Kennedy speech, and uh, the 16-year-olds <laughs> bit on that. And uh, you know, when I when I repeated that uh, at the you know the, the event a year ago, that's when they came up, and uh, I said, "Today I'm challenging high school students to go out and build this moon base." The next day, a young student from uh, from one of the schools in, in Honolulu came, walked up to the edge of the stage pointed at me and said, Hank Rogers, we accept your challenge. And it like it's like, whoa. What do I do next? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you are on. So basically us gray hairs, our job is to give the young people chance and, and then get out of the way. And so I said, everybody in this conference who has any gray hair from today is a mentor. <laughs> you are mentors and any students that have any question is allowed to call any of us and get any kind of advice and and basically that's how we're going to move forward that is pretty incredible and of course uh, that implies having a teacher cadre who can follow in suit and uh, it can continue the inspiration when when you're doing something else and uh, so we we have to work on that I guess as well how do you I haven't ever thought about that but what when we, you we have an obligation and responsibility here 
creating a, gener a really exciting core of activity that can have many directions, nine in this case, we need to keep keep feeding it, keep enthusing it, and keep empowering it with uh, speakers, advisors, mentors, teachers. So that's yeah. an interesting interesting uh, social challenge here for us. Yeah, uh, somebody at the uh, conference called me a social architect. So, you know, putting all these various thinkers from different areas together and figure out who needs to be at which table and all that. Uh, and I think uh, for, as a first experiment for me to doing something like this, I think we did, we did uh, surprisingly well. That, that's fantastic. And so how does this get publicized? How do people join in if they want to? How do other schools, other teachers hook in? Uh, how about companies that want to be part of this? So we have one of the working groups is PR. <laughs> so <laughs> they are working totally on this, how to reach out to companies, schools, whatever, and, and get them involved. And so we'll be doing websites. We, we had cameras everywhere. We even had on the um, individual work group sessions, um, we designed a table where, uh, you know, where 13, 14 people could sit around the table, and we put a camera right in the middle, a 360, 240 camera that recorded everything everybody said equally. And you can use, a, uh, you can use a, 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 an iPhone and watch that, and you can turn it around, and then you can see whoever's speaking. And then we can pick that up and put that in a video. So we're we're looking to make YouTube videos. We're we're looking we're working with. Uh, gosh, do you remember who who it was that? Uh, I think it was Discovery Channel people were there, that are doing a, uh, a movie about this. Um, so the making of the moon base. Um, I mean, there's there's lots of other interest. We had three film crews there at the same time and a photographer. So and that, that's fascinating. And that once again, what intrigues me is that same level of energy and creativity is required to make the whole drone thing work. You mentioned that you've got to have swarms working together in a cooperative fashion, a leader, followers, and adjust as situations occur and such. Which takes us back to John, and we have about 30 seconds here. John, representing the math and science organizations, we need to somehow capture this and enthuse and inspire that new level of, of, of expressive math that helps us move through these areas. Well, that's true. Math is the key for most of these high technology uh, fields. And, you know, besides the, the high school students we had there, they often came with teacher chaperones. So we, we enthused the teachers. And there's nothing more inspiring than the space program to ignite the imagination of the young people. And, you know, I, I see this, the prototype moon base building here as, as a great magnet for Hawaii school children to be inspired, come here, do things. We could have school groups coming over. And then, you know, a lot of these people are going to be employed there doing their own experiments at the moon at the prototype moon base and d developing the new forms of calculus that let us do all that which i won't let you <laughs> off on that one anyway <laughs> gentlemen thank you very much for this really exciting report from last week and actually a report on the future as well and glad to see that Jaden and the gang from university lab school were a part of the action hank and we ought to also do a shout out to jim christopher who put that whole event together in the capital last year and led us <laughs> to this point here so once again thanks for coming on the show Drones and space tied together. I love it. John Hamilton, Hank Rogers, thanks so much for coming on. Oh, to the moon. Air. We go to the moon. <laughs> okay, got it.